Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It Book by William Walker Atkinson Narrated by Andrew Originally published in 1909 This is a great audiobook production created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 20 General Instructions In this chapter, we shall call your attention to certain of the general principles already mentioned in the preceding chapters for the purpose of further impressing them upon your mind and in order that you may be able to think of and to consider them independent of the details of the special phases of memory. This chapter may be considered in the nature of a general review of certain fundamental principles mentioned in the body of the work. Point I. Give to the thing that you wish to memorize as great a degree of concentrated attention as possible. We have explained the reason for this advice in many places in the book. The degree of concentrated attention bestowed upon the object under consideration determines the strength, clearness, and depth of the impression received and stored away in the subconsciousness. The character of these stored away impressions determines the degree of ease in remembrance and recollection. Point 2. In considering an object to be memorized, endeavor to obtain the impressions through as many faculties and senses as possible. The reason for this advice should be apparent to you if you have carefully read the preceding chapters. An impression received through both sound and sight is doubly as strong as one received through but one of these channels. You may remember a name or word either by having seen it in writing or print or else by reason of having heard it. But if you have both seen and heard it, you have a double impression and possess two possible ways of reviving the impression. You are able to remember an orange by reason of having seen it, smelt it, felt it, and tasted it and having heard its name pronounced. Endeavor to know a thing from as many sense impressions as possible. Use the eye to assist ear impressions and the ear to assist in eye impressions. See the thing from as many angles as possible. Point 3. Sense impressions may be strengthened by exercising the particular faculty through which the weak impressions are received. You will find that either your eye memory is better than your ear memory or vice versa. The remedy lies in exercising the weaker faculty so as to bring it up to the standard of the stronger. The chapters of eye and ear training will help you along these lines. The same rule applies to the several phases of memory, develop the weak ones, and the strong ones will take care of themselves. The only way to develop a sense or faculty is to intelligently train, exercise, and use it. Use, exercise, and practice will work miracles in this direction. Point 4. Make your first impression strong and firm enough to serve as a basis for subsequent ones. Get into the habit of fixing a clear, strong impression of a thing to be considered from the first. Otherwise, you are trying to build up a large structure upon a poor foundation. Each time you revive an impression, you deepen it. But if you have only a dim impression to begin with, the deepened impressions will not include details omitted in the first one. It is like taking a good sharp negative of a picture that you intend to enlarge afterward. The details lacking in the small picture will not appear in the enlargement but those that do appear in the small one will be enlarged with the picture. Point V. Revive your impressions frequently and thus deepen them. You will know more of a picture by seeing it a few minutes every day for a week than you would by spending several hours before it at one time. So it is with the memory. By recalling an impression a number of times, you fix it indelibly in your mind in such a way that it may be readily found when needed. Such impressions are like favorite tools which you need every little while. They are not apt to be mislaid as are those which are but seldom used. Use your imagination in going over a thing that you wish to remember. If you are studying a thing, you will find that this going over in your imagination will help you materially in disclosing the things that you have not remembered about it. By thus recognizing your weak points of memory, you may be able to pick up the missing details when you study the object itself the next time. Point 6. Use your memory and place confidence in it. One of the important things in the cultivation of the memory is the actual use of it. Begin to trust it a little, and then more, and then still more, and it will rise to the occasion. The man who has to tie a string around his finger in order to remember certain things soon begins to cease to use his memory and in the end forgets to remember the string or what it is for. There are many details, of course, with which it is folly to charge the memory, but one should never allow his memory to fall into disuse. If you are in an occupation in which the work is done by mechanical helps, then you should exercise the memory by learning verses or other things in order to keep it in active practice. 
Do not allow your memory to atrophy. Point 7. Establish as many associations for an impression as possible. If you have studied the preceding chapters, you will recognize the value of this point. Association is memory's method of indexing and cross-indexing. Each association renders it easier to remember or recollect the thing. Each association gives you another string to your mental bow. Endeavor to associate a new bit of knowledge with something already known by and familiar to you. In this way, to avoid the danger of having the thing isolated and alone in your mind, without a label or index number and name. Connect your object or thought to be remembered with other objects or thoughts by the association of contiguity in space and time and by relationship of kind, resemblance, or oppositeness. Sometimes the latter is very useful. As in the case of the man who said that Smith reminds me so much of Brown, he's so different. You will often be able to remember a thing by remembering something else that happened at the same place. Or about the same time, these things give you the loose ends of recollection whereby you may unwind the ball of memory. In the same way, one is often able to recollect names by slowly running over the alphabet with a pencil. Until the sight of the capital first letter of the name brings the memory of those following it. This, however, only when the name has previously been memorized by sight. In the same way, the first few notes of a musical selection will enable you to remember the whole air, or the first words of a sentence, the entire speech or selection following it. In trying to remember a thing which has escaped you, you will find it helpful to think of something associated with that thing, even remotely. A little practice will enable you to recollect the thing along the lines of the faintest association or clue. Some men are adept memory detectives following this plan. The loose end in memory is all the expert requires. Any associations furnish these loose ends. An interesting and important fact to remember in this connection is that if you have some one thing that tends to escape your memory, you may counteract the trouble by noting the associated things that have previously served to bring it into mind with you. The associated thing once noted may thereafter be used as a loose end with which to unwind the elusive fact or impression. This idea of association is quite fascinating when you begin to employ it in your memory exercises and work. And you will find many little methods of using it. But always use natural association and avoid the temptation of endeavoring to tie your memory up with the red tape of the artificial systems. Point 8. Group your impressions. This is but a form of association but is very important. If you can arrange your bits of knowledge and fact into logical groups, you will always be master of your subject. By associating your knowledge with other knowledge along the same general lines, both by resemblances and by opposites, you will be able to find what you need just when you need it. Napoleon Bonaparte had a mind trained along these lines. He said that his memory was like a large case of small drawers and pigeonholes, in which he filed his information according to its kind. In order to do this, he used the methods mentioned in this book of comparing the new thing with the old ones and then deciding into which group it naturally fitted. This is largely a matter of practice and knack, but it may be acquired by a little thought and care, aided by practice. And it will repay one well for the trouble in acquiring it. The following table will be found useful in classifying objects, ideas, facts, etc., so as to correlate and associate them with other facts of a like kind. The table is to be used in the line of questions addressed to oneself regarding the thing under consideration. It somewhat resembles the table of questions given in chapter 17 of this book, but has the advantage of brevity. Memorize this table and use it. You will be delighted at the results after you have caught the knack of applying it. Query table. Ask yourself the following questions regarding the thing under consideration. It will draw out many bits of information and associated knowledge in your mind. 1. What? 2. How? 3. Whence? 4. Why? 5. Where? 6. Whither? 7. When? While the above seven queries are given you as a means of acquiring clear impressions and associations, they will also serve as a magic key to knowledge, if you use them intelligently. If you can answer these questions regarding anything, you will know a great deal about that particular thing. And after you have answered them fully, there will be but little unexpressed knowledge regarding that thing left in your memory. Try them on some one thing, you cannot understand them otherwise, unless you have a very good imagination. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. 
Thanks for listening.